Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for making time to join us this morning at our first information session through this digital webinar engagement platform. My name is Victoria Nguenya, and I'm one of the directors at Sunnibank KZN. Following the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak and the subsequent announcement that the country would be in lockdown, as a bank, we've proactively looked for ways to assist our clients during this time. As a valued KZN client, we have set up the session to provide you with information on the global and the local economic outlook and how that translates into the investment environment and possibly how that would impact your businesses going forward post the lockdown. This session will be followed by a second session on Thursday where we will be providing insights on sound estate planning during this period as well as post uh, the pandemic. To start off the session today, we have with us Kevin Links, who's the chief economist at asset management firm Stanlo, as well as Hank Phil Yoon, a senior portfolio manager. Please note that you will be able to submit your questions at any time during the presentations online while um, on the webinar, and the panelists will address the questions at the end of the session. To get us started, we will then hand over to Kevin Links. Kevin, over to you. Uh, morning, thank you. Morning, everyone. Uh, so, for well, this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to give you an update essentially on how the virus is impacting the world economy. Obviously, I'm not going to go into massive detail for every part, just touch on the highlights of what we think is really critical here. So we're going to focus a little bit on uh, what's happening in the United States, what's happening in the euro area and China, and then we'll bring the discussion back uh, to South Africa and how we're dealing with COVID and obviously what that means for our economy, especially in terms of things like economic growth, unemployment, uh, government finances, the credit rating. So a whole range of things that we're going to try and touch on this morning. Please, uh, if there are any questions, just type them up and I should have a chance later on uh, after Hink has uh, updated you on the markets uh, to deal with some of those questions. So I'm going to talk for around about 35 to 40 minutes. Hink will talk for about 10 minutes or so. And then hopefully we've got some time after that uh, to deal with some of the questions. Um, so in terms of the spread of the virus, obviously the numbers around the world continue to escalate. They're increasing by more or less uh, 70 to 80,000 a day. So uh, the pace or the rate of increase remains fairly high. Uh, the total number, as you would know, is over 4 million. And <clears throat> what has changed though, is where the epicenter of the virus has been. So if you remember, it started essentially in China. It spread a bit in uh, the Asian region, including South Korea, although South Korea got their numbers uh, under control fairly quickly. It then spread across to Europe, uh, started in Italy, spread throughout Europe. Then the epicenter moved to the United States. And you would say that that remains kind of the epicenter uh, because they've got uh, over 1.3 million infections. But where we focused ourselves on is the spread of the virus now into some of the emerging markets where there are big populations. And we are certainly spending some time looking at Russia. Uh, Russia has now overtaken Italy in terms of the number of infections. We're also watching uh, Brazil and then unfortunately India, uh, which has a massive population, their levels of infection are moving up. So. This thing has definitely moved around the world in terms of where the virus has been concentrated. I guess the good news is that as it's moved through the world, the countries that have been substantially impacted seem to be at the moment uh, getting past the worst of it. In other words, if you look at the number of new infections going on within Europe, those numbers have definitely slowed down, particularly places like Italy, Germany's got it well under control. So that would suggest that after the initial uh, surge in infections, countries can bring this reasonably under control. Obviously, what we don't know is 
as you ease back on the lockdown restrictions and as you get your economy functioning again, do you have a surge in the infections that then force you back into some sort of lockdown? That's pretty much untested. We know China has uh, cut back on a lot of their lockdown restrictions and in terms of their data, uh, they're saying that there hasn't been a surge in infections. Obviously, the problem with the Chinese data is that we can't fully trust that, so that's very unfortunate. We know that South Korea has also unlocked a lot of their economy and they don't seem to have a resurge in infections. And at the moment, most of Europe is in the process of easing back on their lockdown restrictions and so far the rate of new infections within Europe are holding. So there is there are some encouraging signals uh, amongst countries that have got past this but as I say the focus for the moment is very much the US and then some of the bigger emerging markets. So you can see how big the US is um, relative to the European countries Obviously, it's spread throughout the United States. Uh, our view was that uh, most of Europe and certainly the United States did not manage this particularly well. Uh, the UK, you can be very critical of how they've managed it. The US, very critical. And I think that accentuated uh, the spread of the virus. Um, and you would argue that for South Africa, we managed it initially very well. We went into the lockdown early, but you can't fully control the spread of this virus. So ultimately it is picking up and it, and it in our minds will continue to pick up in South Africa. Obviously, if you look at a country like Russia or Brazil or India, you can see the numbers are moving up quite a lot quicker. So on a relative basis, it's fair to say that South Africa has done well with this. The debate in South Africa is around should how much of the lockdown should we continue on with? How much damage is the lockdown itself causing? I'll come to that a little bit later, but I would say in a on a global perspective, South Africa's actually done reasonably well, and obviously our number of deaths, relatively speaking, uh, are quite low when you compare with what's been going on in uh, Europe and uh, the United States, and and. And to some extent, that must reflect the age profile of South Africa. Obviously, South Africa has a relatively young population, and we do know this virus is more impactful on older people, especially if people have underlying uh, health issues, then it does have a more of a devastating effect. So I think South Africa, while our numbers have moved up, uh, they're, not, they're certainly not alarming. So the countries we feel that um, have moved past the, the, the peak of this virus and we think are now in a better phase, you can see those on the left-hand side of the chart. I would suggest that a couple of countries initially managed this exceptionally well and uh, have managed to get past it so far well. That would include Australia, Germany and, and uh, South Korea. You would probably add an Austria into that. Uh, I think they've also done quite well. Then the other countries like say a Spain or a France uh, where they didn't initially do exceptionally well in how they managed it, but uh, they seem to have got past the worst of uh, the virus. Uh, and then on the, on the right hand side, you can see the countries we still uh, remain particularly concerned about. Uh, countries like Brazil, Russia, South Africa have included in that, uh, India, India, et cetera. And so the United States is still in that area. They haven't really got on top of it yet. So it's just to illustrate that each country is in, in a different stage of managing the spread of this virus. Uh, the virus spread around the world at uh, different speeds. Certain countries got impacted very early on. Some countries uh, only a bit later on. So everybody is kind of in their own pattern of managing it. And, uh, and clearly we've got to monitor and see uh, that uh, most of this is ultimately brought under control. So our numbers, as I said previously, they are ramping up. Uh, the average, uh, average level of infections on a daily basis is, is essentially over 300. There was some, at some point, some reference 
made to wanting to keep the infection numbers below 90 a day. Clearly, that hasn't been achieved. Um, so our numbers have ramped up. That doesn't mean that you can't ease back on the lockdown restrictions. The lockdown restrictions are only there to try and ensure that your health system is not overwhelmed. That's all the lockdown restrictions ultimately do. So as long as your health system can cope with the number of infections, the number of people needing hospital care, then you can afford to ease back on the lockdown restrictions. And I would argue in South Africa, there is scope to ease back, uh, even though the infection numbers are above 10,000. And that's because our health system is not currently overwhelmed by the virus. In fact, uh, many parts uh, are coping exceptionally well with this. In terms of the average age of people that have become infected, that's 38. So that would be um, uh, not especially high or, or low. It's, it's kind of, I think, what you would anticipate in a country like South Africa. But if you look at the average age of people that have died from this, that number is uh, 63, telling you that it does have a worse impact for people who are a little bit older. Now, going into this virus and into the lockdown, many people suggested, you know, quite a few people suggested that this is not a big deal, that uh, why is there so much focus on this? There is, you have a flu all the time, flus move around every year, some flus are worse than others. So, so what is the big issue with this? And I think that people lose sight of how much damage this has caused in terms of the health environment. So to illustrate the severity of this, I'm just using the UK numbers. And there are two important lines on the chart. The blue line represents the average number of deaths that occur each week within the UK. And I've averaged that for the past five years. So that's from 215 to 219. You can see the average number of deaths. Uh, there are a couple of weeks where the numbers fall off. There's specific reasons around that, a lot to do with holiday as people don't travel as much on the road, uh, particularly around Christmas Day. But the pattern over the last five years has been fairly constant. And then the, the purplish line, that represents the number of people that have died in the UK every week this year. And what you can see is the surge once the virus took hold, the number of deaths escalated on a weekly basis. And in effect, the UK has doubled their death rate during the upsurge in this virus. That gives you some idea of just how much damage this is doing relative to the number of deaths that would normally occur. And given that the number of weekly deaths doubles it's not something the health authorities can simply ignore it's not something a government can say well let's just carry on business as usual that is a massive impact and clearly had the uk not had lockdown these numbers would have been worse so it's it's a significant effect and it's something the health authorities have to be mindful of and i guess all the way through what you're trying to do is to find the balance between guarding um, the the uh, society on a health perspective but at the same time not wrecking your economy by going into too severe lockdown for too long in the background, there are quite a number of attempts to develop treatments and a vaccine. There's no treatment that has been put forward that is especially compelling. There are a number of drugs that are currently being looked at, existing drugs, to see if there's a treatment that can emerge. But so far, you would say the success is modest. So there's no big game changer in terms of treatments. In terms of vaccines, uh, there's a huge number of efforts going on around the world to develop a vaccine. I won't go through all the detail of how many, but at the moment, around six uh, institutions have taken their vaccine into human trial phase. Uh, now, six is not all that substantial, but hopefully others will join in terms of human trials over the coming weeks. And what we hope is out of all of those efforts, uh, we get a vaccine that emerges probably early next year. 
there's an outside chance something could be developed this year but realistically i think we've got to say that something could come about uh, during the course of next year now one of the efforts to develop a vaccine we focused on is from uh, oxford university in the uk they are part of a team they're not the only part of the team and they've made quite significant progress and they are they have now entered a human trial initially they developed a vaccine they tested it in the laboratory then they tested it on monkeys only six monkeys uh, but from the reports the success of the vaccine uh, on those six monkeys was very good very uh, encouraging and so they moved from monkeys into a human trial they started that in april 23rd of april initially just injecting 10 people to see how those people coped with it and now they are in the process of rolling that out uh, ultimately to over a thousand uh, people not all 1000 people will be injected with the vaccine only about half of those will be injected the other half will get a different type of vaccine as a control group and then what they'll do is monitor those people over the coming weeks uh, to see whether or not uh, the vaccine is infected the difficulty these studies have is that you you're trying to test this vaccine and you're not sure if the person will be infected and there are a whole lot of issues with trying to infect people on purpose so it is a, a lengthy process and once you've completed this and it does appear let's say that the vaccine is reasonably effective then the trial would be expanded beyond a thousand people they would ramp it up to around five thousand people test that for a period of time and only after all of that has been successful would they then start to uh, look at rolling that out into the general population so this has got a way to go uh, if everything works perfectly well uh, this vaccine could be ready by the end of the year but you would say realistically maybe it takes longer than that and as i say there are at least six similar efforts underway around the world some in china some in the united states uh, one in Germany, some in the UK to develop a vaccine and we'll monitor that on an ongoing basis. All right, so how's this all impacting the economies? Let's move around the world. The numbers I need to just highlight are extremely negative. Uh, most economies that have gone into lockdown are now going into a very severe recession. Uh, you've essentially uh, created a sudden stop in economic activity. And obviously the fall off as a consequence of that is very dramatic. The question will be, can you remove the lockdown measures and get the economies going? So we've started to see quite a lot of data for the United States. Uh, we've got their first quarter GDP number, as you would expect, it was a significant decline. Uh, in particular, consumer spending has already been hurt. I need to stress though, that this is early days for the US data. Uh, the worst of the virus is really uh, April and May, not so much the first quarter of the year. But you can already see that because March was affected by some form of lockdown in the US, uh, you can see what that initially did to things like consumer spending. Now, this is a decline of 6 to 8%. The types of declines we we're expecting in the second quarter of the year is more in the order of 30 percent so the next time you see this chart if you look at the left hand scale we're expecting these numbers to jump to minus 30 percent or thereabouts so the numbers are going to get dramatically worse now there are already uh, some of that really bad data starting to show up and one of the areas is u.s employment and last week we got the update for april so that's in the midst of the lockdown and what you're seeing on the chart on the screen is a very strange looking chart uh, and that is a chart of total employment in the us you can see it moves up nicely from 2010 all the way through to early 2020 and then in april the us lost in one month 20.5 million jobs and you can see how dramatic the unemployment rate uh, 
or the employment rate falls off in the United States when you lose 20 million jobs in one month. You essentially take total employment almost back to the level that prevailed at the time of the financial crisis. So you can imagine what that's doing to a whole range of things, consumer activity, household income, what that's doing to tax revenue, uh, and obviously the unemployment rate in the US has rocketed. So these numbers, not just for the US, but as we move around the world, you're gonna see similar results coming out as these economies uh, went into lockdown and obviously many parts of the economy went into some form of uh, economic collapse. Other areas of the economy have uh, come under enormous pressure and that pressure was already evident some time ago. One of those areas is obviously anything to do with airline travel, tourism, hotels, all of those very badly affected. So on the screen, I'm just showing you the number of people that are moving through the US airport system on a daily basis. And I'm showing you it as a year on year percentage change. And you can see that decline has been uh, over 90%. Uh, and that is massive uh, for the entire airline industry in the United States and obviously the similar numbers you see internationally. So the airline industry and associated industries in essentially a standstill environment and clearly that would cause a huge amount of financial strain on those companies and ultimately on uh, government. So some industries perhaps a lot more affected than others but essentially you've had a sudden stop of economic activity. Uh, other areas where you can see that collapse is coming through in something like rail traffic. Uh, this is uh, weekly data, so it's really up to date. And you can see how, how much less rail traffic there is in the US relative to what would have occurred during the same week last year. Um, so you, as we move around the US, look at a whole range of data, I must say you've seen similar numbers unfold uh, across the entire US economy. So for this year, in terms of uh, total growth for the US, we're looking at a decline of about minus 6%. This assumes that the US economy starts to gain some momentum in the second half of the year. We're not assuming that the economy accelerates dramatically, but we're assuming that the lockdown measures are scaled back and that parts of the US economy can start to function more effectively. And then uh, we're saying that that recovery can be extended into 2021. The extent of the recovery into next year in the US is fairly modest. Uh, we're not expecting a massive surge, partly because this virus is doing a lot of lasting damage to economic systems, unemployment, business activity, and it's gonna take time uh, for these economic systems to fully recover. What are the US authorities doing about it? Pretty much everything they can. They're trying to help the economy through this phase. They've cut interest rates almost uh, to essentially zero. They have a range of zero to a quarter percent. Uh, so they've cut interest rates pretty much as much as they can. And they've also, the government has also added a huge spending program. So the government is now uh, spending on a rescue package, 2.2 trillion US dollars, pretty much across every area of the US economy, helping business, large and small, helping households, providing food support, social safety nets, a whole range of spending. Uh, so you can see the effort that the US government is going to. Unfortunately, some of these spending programs have already run out of money, and there are uh, efforts to look at whether they can be increased. Uh, but clearly all of this is costing uh, the economy a huge amount and it's all been done in an effort, effort to try and prop up uh, the little economic activities out there and to make sure that companies at least remain in business. Ultimately, these packages can't generate economic growth. You can only do that once the virus is under control but they're there to support the economy through this phase. And hopefully once the virus is under control, uh, these support mechanisms can start to get the economy functioning better. 
Uh, in addition, uh, the Federal Reserve is printing money, what we call QE, quantitative easing. Uh, they printed initially as they went into the financial crisis and came out of that, but they've reinitiated that printing and the degree of uh, expansion by the Federal Reserve is now unprecedented. In the last couple of weeks, they have added more than $2 trillion in uh, quantitative easing to the US economy as an additional effort to support financial markets and generally liquidity in the economic system. So this is a massive program by the US to try and help their economy. And even with that, the US economy is going to incur its worst recession since uh, the Great Depression. That gives you some idea of how damaging the lockdowns are. If we move across to Europe very quickly, just to show you their numbers are also quite severe. We've had their first quarter. Uh, this is not an annualized number. So if you annualized it, you get to a decline that approaches 15%. Massive fall off in European economic activity across all of the major economies. And so you're seeing the same sort of damage go on within Europe. I just want to show you one other chart in Europe that illustrates how severe it is and that relate, relates to confidence and what we call economic sentiment. And you can see how badly confidence right at the end of this chart has been impacted just within one month of data as you have the lockdowns, as you have people uh, health deteriorate, unemployment starts to rise, confidence plummets dramatically. And we do expect that the confidence numbers will decline further over the coming months. So again, doing huge amount of damage to Europe. Uh, when we turn our attention to China, there's a bit of good news. What is the good news? Well, firstly, their economy did decline dramatically in the first quarter. They had the virus early on, and the virus uh, has obviously undermined Chinese economic activity very dramatically. Again, this number is not annualized. If you annualize it, you get your decline of around 35% in the first quarter. The good news is that China has now got past the worst of the virus <coughs> and they've started to uh, open up their economy. And the data would suggest that China is about 80% back to normal. They're not 100% back to operating normal, but they've eased back substantially on the lockdown restrictions. And you can see their economy is responding to that. So if you look at what's called the PMI, which is an indication of manufacturing activity, you can see how dramatic the number fell off in February. So remember, the, China had the, the worst of the virus very early on in the year. Their worst month was February. So activity falls off. But then when we see March and April data for China, the number has gone back above the critical 50 index, which suggests expansion, which is telling you that Chinese manufacturing is starting to reopen up and trying to get activity back to where it was before the crisis hit. So that gives us some hope that if you get the virus under control, you can start to ease back on lockdown measures and start to re-engage your economy. This is the manufacturing part of China. If you look at the retail sector or the services part of China, you see exactly the same pattern where activity falls off very sharply in uh, February and then it rebounds quite dramatically in March and April. So we're watching China very carefully. We hope they've been more honest with the data. Uh, but if China can uh, continue this on, then it should be quite beneficial for uh, key parts of the world economy, but also critically, it tells other countries that you can get on top of this virus and ultimately get your economy functioning. So to me, that is quite important information to follow. So that gives you an idea of the fall off in economic activity we're expecting uh, this year. We are saying that every major economy in the world will have a recession this year. Let me repeat that every major economy in the world uh, will have a recession. That includes China, Europe, the United States, South Africa, and a whole range of uh, European large emerging markets, 
Uh, pretty much every major economy you can think of, we think will have a recession this year. And then we're assuming that systematically each country will get on top of their virus uh, numbers and start to ease back on the lockdown restrictions and get their economy going during the course of next year. Some countries will see activity pick up this year, later this year. Other countries may be a bit delayed, but we are at this stage fairly hopeful that economic activity starts to resume systematically in the second half of this year and more fully during the course of next year. That assumption is, uh, is critical in that we're hoping the infection numbers don't resurge. In other words, if we find that there's a second wave, a third wave of infections that is potentially bigger than the first wave, then obviously uh, these numbers are going to have to be revised dramatically. So I think that's where a lot of focus is going in terms of understanding this infection. Will there be a second and third wave around the world? How big will those waves of infection be and how best to control that? And in the meantime, there's a hope that obviously a vaccine is being worked on very actively and potentially uh, we have a vaccine that is available uh, at the time when it's possible to get a second or third wave. So there are a number of critical areas that we're watching. So let's turn our attention to South Africa. What's our numbers look like? We're saying this year we declined by 6%, uh, with most of that decline happening in the first half of the year. Remember, we ended last year in recession. So essentially, we continue on with a recession during the course of this year. The recession has obviously intensified. We're hoping that we get positive GDP in the third quarter of this year as we ease back further on the lockdown restrictions. But you can see already the pace at which we, we ease in the lockdown seems to be quite slow. It's going to take time for the economy to uh, get going again. And so uh, for the year as a whole, we've got a dramatic decline. We have got an improvement put in for next year and the year after, but if you look at those percentages, they're not particularly uh, robust. In other words, we are concerned that the current lockdown and the current uh, damage from the rest of the world economy will have a lasting effect on South Africa. Now, part of that has to do with employment. So. Uh, we are saying, I'm just skipping over that chart, we are saying that over the next 12 months or from the second quarter of this year to the second quarter of next year, we're going to lose 1.7 million jobs. Now, that is massive. Where do we think those job losses will occur? Pretty much every sector of the economy. Some sectors more impacted, say things like retail trade, Obviously, informal trading, uh, the informal sector more impacted. Uh, we're saying businesses ultimately will fail, various parts of the service industry. But there's no part of the economy that is able to weather this without some sort of damaging effect. Food production and food uh, retail perhaps a little bit more cushioned because they've remain, um, remained open but ultimately even for them, they are under some pressure. And it's these types of job losses which makes it difficult for the economy to get back to where it was because we don't think that the job losses that we're going to incur are immediately going to uh, come back as the economy starts to open up. How severe is the decline in the very short term? I just wanted to show you motor vehicle sales for April, that number came out fairly recently, and if you look at that chart, uh, vehicle sales declined by 98% in uh, April. Essentially, most of the vehicle dealerships were closed. You couldn't buy a vehicle even if you wanted to, uh, and you don't easily get past that sort of decline. Hopefully, as I say, we can start to remove the lockdown measures and get key parts of the economy functioning but a significant amount of damage has already been inflicted. What's this going to do to government finances? Well, it's clearly going to put taxes under enormous pressure. Already we're talking about 70 to 80 billion revenue shortfall. I need to stress though that I think this number is conservative. 
uh, the number, I think, as we get more information, is probably going to go to over a hundred billion revenue shortfall. And you can imagine that when you're not selling vehicles, you're not shopping, you're not doing a whole range of things, the tax revenue that the government's losing is enormous. It's not just cigarettes and other types of uh, fuel levy, for example. It's also to do with corporate taxes, um, VAT receipts have fallen off, import duties are not as they were. So the government is incurring a massive loss of tax revenue. Uh, which is then going to put pressure on the government's uh, budget. We're saying that we're going to have a budget deficit or a fiscal deficit that equates to around 12% of GDP this year. That means that government, in order to fund that, is going to have to borrow significantly more. Now, please, do you need to put this in context? Government would normally not want their deficit to go over 4% and ideally have it less than 3% of GDP. So 12% is enormous. Uh, it gives you some idea of just how much strain government finances are under. It means that government debt is now going to rise very dramatically. Uh, if you look just two years ago, uh, the chart gives you some idea of what government debt was looking like. That was two years ago. Now we're looking at government debt moving up to well over 70% on its way to 80%. And this government debt that I'm showing you excludes the SOE debt. It excludes Eskom, Transnet, South African Airways. You would add that debt on top. So there's no doubt that the government has become hugely more indebted through this phase. Uh, not that government finances was in great shape before this uh, took place. It was already deteriorating and clearly uh, the impact of the lockdown has now aggravated that quite dramatically. When you see those sorts of numbers, you can understand why uh, the credit rating was revised down. S&P recently took us now down another notch. for So from S&P, Standard & Poor's, we're on a double B minus credit rating. Uh, that is three notches below investment grade. Uh, all of the rating agencies have moved us below investment grade, and clearly they uh, should be concerned about the deterioration in government finances uh, and clearly warning investors that South Africa has become a more risky environment. There is some good news if you're watching the petrol price. That has come off dramatically. Uh, the petrol price has declined. Uh, over the last year by around about 26 percent uh, and clearly that's helping to bring uh, inflation under control so inflation over the coming months is going to fall to around three percent then move up a little bit because of base effects but essentially i think inflation is at least uh, not a problem even though the currency has weakened and that means that the reserve bank can uh, afford to cut interest rates. They've already cut quite dramatically. I think they can cut interest rates another 50 to 100 basis points this year. I think given where inflation is, given how weak the economy is, there is scope to do that. But uh, none of these measures can compensate for the shutdown of business activity, the loss of employment. All of that uh, is doing some substantial damage. The government is looking to try and uh, fund this. Obviously, uh, we've initiated a 500 billion support program for the economy. Uh, I think that support program is appropriate in that they're trying to help prop up social payment systems. They're trying to provide food relatively ineffectively, but at least there's an effort. Uh, they're trying to support the business sector. So all of that government is saying will cost them 500 billion. Where are they going to get the money from? Well, some of it will be reprioritization of spending from other areas where they can divert money from other government departments to help in this. Um, they also saying that <clears throat> they will have to go to the IMF to get some uh, COVID-19 related finance. We think that can amount to around 80 billion rand. They can go to the new development bank and get uh, 1 billion US dollars there. That is an automatic facility. We don't have to go through a whole lot of um, 
onerous restrictions to get that. So government is putting in an effort to try and raise this money, but it does mean that government is going to become substantially more indebted as they try and support their economy. Uh, so clearly the focus for South Africa now is can we continue to ease back on the lockdown restrictions? Can we get this economy functioning more effectively? Can we, while we do that, keep the virus numbers reasonably under control and the health system functioning? And then it's going to, then we're going to enter a critical phase for South Africa. And that phase is can we get South Africa's economy functioning more effectively in the coming years, which is going to require a much bigger effort than we've seen from government in recent years. So there's a lot on the table, a lot we focused on, but hopefully that gives you some idea of how this is playing out around the world and how it's impacting South Africa. So now I'm going to uh, ask uh, Hink to go through his part of the presentation, which would focus on uh, what this is doing to financial markets and how they're managing their, their finances and their investments through this phase. Obviously, that's the critical component for us in terms of how do we manage money as we go through all of this. Thanks a lot. I'll come back when uh, we get to the end and perhaps uh, deal with some questions. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Hank Falun here. Um, I'm just going to deal with uh, a number of issues here. Um, let me just see. Uh, talk a little bit about my journey to the balance team. Uh, some of the key messages, I think Kevin has touched on a number of those. And then the idea would be for me to talk a little bit about the tactical allocation decisions that we've taken around the balance cautious fund and uh, maybe to see how that plays out in terms of the opportunities as an investor in these difficult times, trying to determine where and what is the best options available for investing for the medium to longer term, given the turbulent times we live in. So Hink, myself- can you maybe uh, just try and, sorry, Hank, can you make your screen full screen? Because it might be that you've got it in a smaller size. Can you just see if you can uh, make it full screen? It shows full screen here by, on my side. Okay. Sorry. Um, um, no, yeah, that's it shows full screen on my side. I apologize for that. So um, obviously I uh, started the fixed interest franchise a number of years ago, uh, did what I would like to believe is a global best practice handover during the latter part of last year and then decided to move to the balance team where I'm focusing on the balance cautious fund, working with Herman van Felsen. And we recently uh, appointed Andrew Cuff as our head of research. Uh, so there's a very strong uh, team behind us uh, doing equity research specifically around SA and African assets uh, to support uh, the efforts in that space. Um, if we look at the markets, obviously South Africa um, has not been spared the pandemic. Um, I think Kevin has spoken a lot uh, on a number of these issues, but I think one of the things that has really materialized is the opportunity set that bonds have offered us uh, during these turbulent times. Uh, there was a big concern initially about what the effect of the South Africa being pushed out of the Wigby index will be. There's big numbers pushed around many billions of dollars, but eventually when that reweighting happened, the impact that happened in the market was actually very small. And to a large extent, that was to a large extent also coordinated with an effort by the Reserve Bank stepping in to stabilize the uncertainty and volatility in the market and then resulting in quite a dramatic, sharp downward movement in bond yields. And to a large extent, we've been able to capture some of that opportunity set for the market. As far as risk assets are concerned, um, we believe that there's a number of opportunities available, but our preference at the moment has certainly been around global equities. So you will see in the portfolio, we show quite a big overweight in global equities, but we also like technology, diversified miners and insurance in SA. This is uh, the foreign flows, and you can clearly see that foreigners became big sellers, both in bonds and equities. But in the very recent past, uh, we've seen a bit of a turnaround in that position uh, from uh, foreigners becoming small buyers. At one point in time, 
once again turning to be sellers. I think Kevin did speak about the uh, fiscal activity. Obviously, for ourselves, uh, the absolute level of interest rates uh, often determine the the anchor is determined by the anchor in the money market. And with the money market rates moving down, and the likelihood that interest rates on the short side could move further down, it certainly makes a lot of sense to be invested in high yielding bonds because the real return that it's offering is so compelling over a three to five year term that one should not ignore that as an opportunity set for funds. We've seen the Reserve Bank come in, as I said before, they've been buying bonds. They've also initially started with some changes in banking regulations. Uh, very interesting, if you look at the numbers available up to now, about 80% of the bonds that have been bought year to date has actually been taken up by banks. So banks have been big buyers of bonds, given the uncertainty that's in the market, as well as the fact that they've seen quite a drop off in demand for normal banking requirements uh, in the light of uh, the initial slowdown in the economy. Obviously, that is likely to change going forward. Obviously, the kind of measures that we brought in South Africa is starkly different to international um, funds. And I think Kevin has alluded to the amount of money that particularly America is having available to support the economy. Here's just a graph to show you that absolute attractive real yield. And if you look at this and the construct of the typical emerging market fund, they will certainly find this very attractive. And in a world where there's very little yield available, we believe that South African bonds, although maybe this outlook of negative fiscal environment uh, will play a role, will certainly find a place in many offshore portfolios. And therefore, we should see some good support for our market coming from international markets. As far as the tactical asset allocation is, uh, this is the Balanced Cautious Fund. It shows you the equity holding at the moment at 18%. Um, I've deliberately showed the portfolio at the 20th of March, which is some time ago, to give you an idea of what portfolio actions we've taken. We've also uh, overweighted the international equity portfolio. Uh, the manager, a Columbia Threat Mule that we use there, has done phenomenally well and has outperformed most of the indices because of the tactical position. They took it particularly technology stocks. As far as SA bonds are concerned, here the portfolio was still invested to the tune of 36%. During the sell-off that we had um, when the weekly re-weighting was going to happen, we increased this holding to just below 40% at the moment, using mainly some of the offshore cash. We brought a little bit of that back and some of the local cash, taking that up uh, quite dramatically to give the bond quite a significant exposure to bonds uh, as the market stand at the moment. When you look at the equity holding, you can see that over time, the global equity holding has been increased um, and the local equity holding has been decreased. And that is specifically because of the attractiveness of the risk assets um, in global markets compared to the attractiveness of SA assets, given the uncertainty that we have around the domestic economy and other factors playing out locally. This is the valuation of equities. Although they look attractive um, on a relative basis, it is important to remember that the earnings of uh, equities is expected to dramatically drop. And this graph to a large extent will reset uh, because of that. Maybe of major interest for the audience today will be the positioning that we've got in our equity portfolio. Now, when you look at the portfolio positioning here, you can see that we are quite underweight banks. Obviously there's a number of big challenges ahead for banks and the impact of the regulations that are going to be implemented by banks with some government support potentially will impact the profitability of banks for years to come, we believe. On the other hand, insurance companies uh, have quite sound balance sheets, and we believe that most of the insurance companies will weather the storm quite well, uh, given the environment that they operate in. On the other hand, also, we've been very negative on property stocks for a long period of time, and you can see we have maintained our total underweight position on the property sector for uh, a number of uh, years now, and it's actually been a very good strategy implemented in the portfolios. When you look at the industrial part of our portfolio, we like the uh, Bitcorp group, 
and Bitvest, and we've overweighted those diversified industrials. We also believe that food producers are the ones area in the market that will do well given the current environment. And then I think the big um, positive of this portfolio is that we've held an overweight position in the NASPERS process shares, and that has certainly been a very big contributor to the good performance that this equity block has given to the portfolio. Telcos, uh, we like MTN uh, and a little bit of Vodacom there. And then maybe lastly, but not least, is that we believe that companies like BHP Billiton and Anglo-America will do well um, through the Chinese demand. We believe that if one economy will recover quicker than the rest, it will probably be Anglos. So therefore, quite an overweight in the diversified uh, miners in, in the portfolio. So in conclusion, um, the fund sitting in the second quartile, I think if you look at the very short term, it's probably now moved to the first quarter, but certainly across all the funds um, in the balance franchise, we've seen quite a strong recovery. Uh, even the equity fund, which uh, I think had quite a tough year in 2019, has certainly done very well year to date. And that's a clear indication of having the right strategy, following the quality growth principle in our portfolios and making sure that in the selection of equities, we focus on buying equities that has got strong balance sheets um, and good prospects to survive the current environment, and also the business models that will probably fit best to a world which will see quite a lot of change in the future. So in summary, um, I think South Africa is not alone in the pandemic. We all kind of looking at how this is not only influencing South Africa. We believe that bonds at current levels have uh, retraced quite a bit, but it still remained quite attractive. And as Kevin has alluded, when we see a further downward move in interest rates, it is quite likely that we could see further downward movements in bond yields, uh, even from these levels where they are trading after having a pullback from the highs. Um, in that process, we're obviously looking for risk assets. And as we've said before, our preference for risk assets at the moment is to be overweight offshore equities, and maybe just to elude a little bit to the exposure there, which is 21%, it has got the global portfolio as well as 2% in the EM and 2% in the European equity funds as positions at the moment. So we expect quite a big uh, impact on the domestic economy. We are still unsure how big it will be. And as Kevin has alluded, we will see probably a movement in the numbers as more and more information becomes available. And we will probably be guided by that in terms of many decisions that we have to take going forward. But we think that there will be good opportunities. We believe that some companies will weather the storm significantly better, and therefore they will continue to outperform and probably do more outperformance in the future compared to what we've already seen in, in the portfolios up to date. And then lastly, I think we should not ignore the fact that the current year is a very challenging year for our president. And the current environment will probably be very important to see how South Africa as a country comes out of the crisis and where the powers to be kind of lands uh, post uh, the coronavirus politically. And that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got, thanks a lot for that. We've got a couple of questions uh, and um, one of the questions is if somebody wants to uh, get more information around uh, obviously Standlib investing and specifically the person's asking around bond investing, how would they how would they approach that? Well, I think uh, it's it, uh, given the technology era that we live in and what is available, uh, we have a very good uh, website um, and we should uh, one should be able to get the necessary information there. And uh, there's also information available of people in the call center or in the help center that can assist people to implement whatever strategy they want to do uh, for their portfolios. Okay, so obviously easily available, even though we're in lockdown to, um, to get into any of the investment products. Yeah, I think all the products are available. It is just a matter of going through probably a slightly different channel or approach compared to the traditional uh, uh, process of uh, one should also potentially be able to go to the, the, the bank branch that are open at this point in time 
uh, depending um, where and which banks are open at this point in time in the region. Henk, we've also got a question around the currency and uh, saying that, yes, the currency is oversold. Can you just give us your perspective uh, on, on the outlook for the currency? Obviously, it plays a key part in how you're managing the balanced funds. So what, are you, what view are you adopting around currency in your investment portfolio? Yeah, I think that's it. I didn't really touch on that. Uh, there's a bit of a time limit, but it's a good question. So what we've done in our portfolio, we've hit roughly 3% of the portfolio with a currency collar, effectively ensuring that in the event of the RAND pulling back, that we will be able to capture uh, the higher uh, weakness of the currency on a portion of the portfolio. Now, our view would be that the current sell-off that we've seen in the EM space, and we should never forget that South Africa, to a large extent, often finds itself uh, dragged along with the rest of the EM space uh, is something that will probably ease going forward. And therefore, we expect the currency pro to probably ease back to run about uh, the 16 and a half uh, uh, level to the rand. We don't foresee the currency appreciating uh, to the kind of levels that we saw earlier in the year. I think that's fair to say, but we do believe that there's a good likelihood that the currency will appreciate. And one of the main drivers for that would be the improvement in the current account, because I think for, uh, foreign um, activity is probably higher to what is happening in South Africa. Therefore, our exports are still finding homes, while the domestic activity is very low and very few imports are happening at the moment, along with a much lower petrol price cost. So we believe the current account will, to a certain extent, support a slightly stronger currency. And can then just uh, one final uh, sort of comment, if you can, please, around um, money market uh, investments. So obviously a lot of people nervous at this time, a lot of people wanting to simply put their money in, a, say, a bank account. Uh, what, is your, what is your perspective around that type of strategy? In other words, uh, somebody wanting to be very conservative in how they invest versus uh, looking at a even a conservative balanced fund or some uh, other balanced fund, what would be your general guideline for people who are a little bit nervous now? Yeah, so I think uh, what we should essentially always remember is that investing is for the medium to longer term. So the balanced cautious is a type of fund that obviously don't take a lot of risk. We have never more than 40% equities. We are very deliberate about how we expose the fund to risk assets like bonds. And um, if you look at what you can earn from a money market fund now, uh, that's probably somewhere around about 4%. It uh, could even be slightly below that, depending on the fees that's payable. And uh, going forward, that uh, yield might well drop uh, towards 3% if further rate cuts happen. If you look at what the balance cautious fund will deliver you, um, being invested in bonds, giving you a real return of roughly 8% at the moment, as well as equities that we have seen quite a remarkable recovery from. We believe that over the next three to five year cycle, the balance cautious fund will easily give you the CPI plus three kind of return. So it might be slightly more aggressive compared to a money market investment, but certainly the unattractiveness of money market rates certainly uh, makes a good case for having a, a portion or a large portion of one's money in a slightly uh, more diverse fund that is actively managed across different asset losses. Because the important thing here is diversification and making sure that one has exposure to different asset losses as not all asset losses are likely to perform similar going forward. Okay, the last thing, just a question which I'll deal with, a uh, person asking uh, how much extra damage has COVID-19 done to South Africa? Weren't we in difficulty to start with? And yes, we were in significant, under significant pressure towards the end of last year. And in fact, over the last five years, you can see the economy has struggled, growth of around 1% or lower, the unemployment rate keeps rising. So South Africa was taking strain before COVID-19 came about. We were in recession at the end of last year and we were concerned about where the economy is going. So clearly, uh, when you go into a COVID-19 type environment and you're already weak in terms of economic activity, it does exacerbate 
the negative impact of the lockdown and I think we've seen that play out already. So uh, I, I'm of the view that the lockdown has done massive damage to the economy, the health issue is very significant. Uh, what we're hoping though is that this is a wake-up call, that this is a, a, a real point where you've got a crisis, government looks at it and recognises that they have to make uh, bigger, more substantial changes to how the economy functions going forward. Otherwise, uh, the environment's going to continue on at uh, around the 1%, 1.5%, not creating jobs. And that over the medium to longer term, that's certainly not sustainable. So we're urging government to use this crisis in a positive way as a catalyst to uh, implement much more meaningful policy changes. That's all from our side. I see we up at uh, up at the hour. Thanks a lot for attending. Hopefully it was uh, interesting. Uh, please, if you obviously want copies of this, uh, we can get those to you. So from my side, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, be safe out there. All the best. Thank you, gentlemen, for that very informative and encouraging presentation. Um, please, uh, ladies and gents, if you have any questions that you'd like us to address, you're very welcome to send them through. There were details indicated on your invites. Alternatively, you're welcome to forward them through to your account executives or your business managers, and we'll make sure that we send them through to Kevin and Hank to respond. Thank you once again for joining us. Um, and please be on the lookout for an invite to the Thursday session where we'll be tackling um, more around sound estate planning. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye.